<laughs> so defeating EMS and sepsis, or defeating sepsis and EMS. So this is sepsis. It's elusive, it's expensive to treat, and it's lethal. And it's wreaking havoc in Gotham. And the trouble is that most cities in Europe, in Australia, in the US are not so different than Gotham, and we're not doing too well when it comes to sepsis. So what's the scope of the problem? In the US alone, we have over a million cases of sepsis every year. It costs us $20 billion in costs. And we think somewhere around 20% of patients diagnosed with sepsis in the in-hospital setting will die. Not good numbers. And this is the critical realization that you have to have, is that sepsis is a time-dependent pathology. This realization is critical. From the outset, we're fighting the clock. And that makes this the key, early intervention starting as early as possible after we figure out that a patient is septic. And by intervening early and aggressively, we estimate 92,000 lives every year can be saved, in addition to a billion and a half dollars in costs. So you have a patient in front of you who, to use the Australianism, is big sick. How do you know if that big sick is sepsis or if it's something else? And here's a couple of tools. We're all familiar with this, modified Sears, modified SOFA. I'm not going to dive into that whole debate. I think the important part of this is it's the whole picture. It's just salt. It's you. It's you as the clinical expert saying, how do I take all of this and put it into something that says, I think this is sepsis? And I've outlined a couple of things. There's a couple common themes between these two. You have respiratory rate, you have temperature, you have lactate. And again, it's taking that whole picture. One of the problems with Sears to some degree, but especially SOFA, is the lack of specificity, right? There's a lot of information there, but it's not specific to sepsis. They're not diagnosing sepsis specifically. And that makes temperature very, very important. Now, a lot of my friends in Australia and Europe, they're testing temperature on every patient. I wish that were true in the US. We're not so good at it, and we should be, because what you can do with temperature is make Sears extraordinarily sensitive. You don't necessarily improve its specificity, but if you have those Sears criteria, you have your expertise, and the patient is very hypo or hyperthermic without a, uh, you know, another cause, you can say, that's going to lead me more towards uh, a, a diagnosis of sepsis. And the other one is end tidal CO2. And end tidal CO2 is fantastic for two reasons. The first is respiratory rate. And we're all terrible at respiratory rate. Not every patient has a respiratory rate of 16. I know that's shocking, but it's true. And what we've seen in the literature is that those patients who are tachypnic it's not necessarily uh, a, 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 uh, an issue in and of itself, but it tells you this patient is extraordinarily sick. It's a marker of disease severity. And similarly with end tidal CO2, there's been suggestion that it correlates well with lactate. And again, lactate does not diagnose sepsis, but it tells you you have a patient who's very, very sick. So with end tidal CO2, if I have a patient whose end tidal is 20 or less, that's 20 millimeters of mercury, I get very, very worried, and so should you. So the question is, how do we measure end tidal CO2? If you have those nice cannulae, they're awesome, they're great, use them if, if you have them. If not, uh, Ruben Strayer's website, EM Updates, has a great uh, how-to, use a mask and some simple things. It's in every ambulance, every emergency department. Um, it's a great technique. He also makes reference to a paper, his words, by an obscure author in the Air Medical Journal, I had to bring Vin LeCong here. This is another setup, and it gives you end tidal CO2. So now we've determined we think a patient is septic. What do we do about it? And we've had sepsis 2.0, early goal-directed therapy, sepsis 3.0, promise, arise, process, all of these. And what I would posit to you is that in, in the early stages, they don't matter. Bundled therapy, protocols, it doesn't matter. What matters is early, aggressive intervention. The details don't matter in our setting. Now, this is the major problem in sepsis. This is distributive shock. It's not hypovolemic shock. It's distributive. So you can try this, and you should. A judicious fluid bolus, 30 mils per kilo, is necessary. It's a good thing. But the odds are, because it's distributive shock, it's not going to fix your problem. You're going to have to go to vasopressors early. Um, the question that comes up with fluid is, how much is safe? Uh, Dr. Ben Zabar was very kind to give me these images. Here we have dynamic collapse of the IVC. Not a particularly good test 
for fluid responsiveness, but it is a very good test for fluid tolerance. Is it safe to give more fluids? And if you think the patient needs more fluids and you have dynamic collapse, it's probably a good idea. But odds are it's not going to fix the problem, as I said. So you have to go to vasopressors. There's not good evidence, epinephrine, norepinephrine, dopamine, thank God it's finally gone in most places. We've gone to norepinephrine and epinephrine. And I think for most patients, norepinephrine is a good choice, but there are, there are a small subset of patients for whom epi is better. And here's a good way to figure out which. Again, point of care ultrasound. Take a look at the heart, and look at this heart. We're not looking for details. This is a broad 10,000-foot view. This is a heart that's not beating well. And for these patients, epinephrine is probably a better choice. Now that brings me to the last stage of therapy in the pre-hospital setting, which is antibiotics. We know for every delay in antibiotics, mortality increases. It's not some other endpoint, it's mortality. The longer you wait to get antibiotics on board, the higher the mortality goes. So we need to get broad spectrum antibiotics on board early. And you say, well, what if we don't have a pump? Well, we don't need a pump for TXA either. We figured that out. You don't need a pump for antibiotics. Get the antibiotics in and patients are going to do better. And that brings me to my last point. And I think this is the most important aspect of it. We talk about sepsis, what's important in sepsis. But the truth is, at this point in the pre-hospital setting, it's in, an, it's in its infancy. We're just figuring out that we can make a huge difference in the treatment of sepsis and the outcome of patients by intervening aggressively pre-hospital. So this is my ask of you. Get out there, do the research, ask the questions, talk to each other, come to these conferences and get better because our patients depend on us to have the best evidence, to be passionate about these things, to have better answers. So that, that is the critical, critical thing that has to happen, is that each and every one of you has to get out there and do the work and publish so that we know how to treat these patients most effectively in our setting. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you.